Now, physical fitness is not only one of the most important keys to a healthy body, it is the basis of dynamic and creative intellectual activity. And that's a quote from President John F. Kennedy. Now, in episode 16 of the Walking for Health and Fitness podcast, I'm pleased to interview my first guest. Now, Danny owns the Big Northern Bear YouTube channel and BigNorthernBear.com. He is also the host of the AFib show. Now, Danny is dedicated to sharing his knowledge about AFib, which stands for atrial fibrillation, which is a quivering or irregular heartbeat or arrhythmia. Now, AFib or AF can lead to blood clots, stroke, heart failure, and other heart-related complications. Now, anxiety of having another AFib episode is a major byproduct of AFib and is often the reason many AFib patients do not exercise enough. Now, Danny's YouTube channel, his podcast, his Facebook page, and groups are dedicated to showing other AFib sufferers that you can have an active lifestyle while managing your AFib. Now, as you'll hear in this podcast, AFib is serious and scary, but thankfully, very few people die from AFib. The comorbidities that are associated with the onset of AFib are usually the cause of death of AFib patients. Now, many AFib sufferers fear the onset of an AFib episode because they are so scary. But as Danny will explain, walking played a major role in his recovery, and walking and exercise in general, including, in his case, powerlifting, has kept his AFib and anxiety under control. Now, Danny recently celebrated another year without an AFib episode while doing a live stream for his channel from a lake in Switzerland. Now, Danny also reached the top of a mountain in Switzerland where the oxygen level was so low, his Apple Watch couldn't measure his blood oxygen level, yet he thrived. Danny's message is this. If he can manage his AFib by walking and exercising, then so can you. So I'll let Danny give you more details in episode 16 of the Walking for Health and Fitness podcast. Let's begin. So I'm here with Danny, better known as Big Northern Bear on YouTube and um uh, We'll talk to Danny in the uh, Walking for Health and Fit Fitness podcast today. So, uh, Dan, give me some background on, on who you are and what you do. Thanks, Frank. Well, um, primarily, I have a YouTube channel. That's really what most people care about. But I, I, I'm an AFib patient, so I have atrial fibrillation, which is the most common heart condition in the world. Um, something like 4 or 5% of the population have it. And as you get older more and more people get it. It can uh, go up to, in fact, 15% of the population uh, when you get up into like 85 years of age. Um, and it's a, one of the biggest causes of uh, patient admission into hospitals, emergency room visits. And um, that has an upside. And because it's so common, all kinds of drug companies and surgical monies throw money at studies. So at least the research side is very okay. well funded. But but really, I mean, walking and all that turns out to be one of the best treatments for AFib. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I promote from personal experience. Okay. So, so that's funny. The, the, the simplest, easiest treatment, the least expensive treatment is the one that you probably never heard about. Certainly the <clears> least <throat> risky with the least yeah. side effects. Sure. Like one thing when you have a heart condition is it's almost every drug... Um, that can treat the heart condition comes with side effects galore okay and this was something i found I, I when when i first discovered i had afib i was very unstable and i required very large doses every day of beta blockers which slow your heart rate and so i felt dizzy like mm -hmm. just to get up from my chair right. i felt like i was going to pass out and um uh, I also found that if AFibers and a lot of other part patients and people have had heart attacks, we get what's called ectopic beats. So your heart will just beat four or five times, like out of nowhere, and oh, it's okay. very scary, right? Or it feels like your heart stops for 10 seconds, oh, and then geez. a big beat comes. So both of those things can create a lot of anxiety, and um, they're not harmful in and of themselves, but... They can wreck your quality of life. They can make you feel afraid to exercise for sure. Okay. I always say living with AFib is like living with a jack in the box for your, for a heart. Because you know it's going to go off. You're just never sure when. Mm. So you walk around. When you first have AFib, you walk around on eggshells because you don't want to set it off. 
and and for a lot of us, our first time going into AFib, we thought we were having a heart attack. Okay. And we went to the hospital. And going to the hospital <clears throat> with a heart condition can be a very traumatic experience, even though it turns out you have a non-lethal condition. They don't know that, and you don't know that mm. until you've been through the battery, and then they're it, so it can be a very traumatic thing. And a, a lot of AFib patients cut immediately discover that the AFib comes packed with chronic anxiety that they never had before. It's almost like a post-traumatic stress disorder. And I don't want to compare it to the soldiers and what they've been through, but it's in the same category. It's like you've had this really traumatic event and then get these little reminders of these weird ectopic beats. Mm. And, oh, is that, am I going to AFib? Oh, it passed. It passed in two seconds. Right. And 10 minutes later, bang again. So you're like always on guard. And so we end up like checking our pulse all the time. That's one of the habits. We're always checking our pulse. Um, we're afraid to exercise. Um, we're really afraid to live our lives. So, and I think that's probably why the Facebook group I started called Living Your Life with AFib. Mm, okay. Because, hey, dude, let's live our lives, right? Like that's, that's a big right. important. So, so let me step back. Um, before your first AFib episode, hold that. Um, did you did you know you had it? Did you know you had AFib? I thought, uh, and this is a common story, especially with the younger people. Let's say that in my audience, we seem to have this. But I I, I had these periods where my heart would race. Okay, I was just sitting there. And at the time I was using like some nicotine lozenges. So I thought, oh, I just took too many of those close together. So I actually ignored the racing heart. Mm -hmm. And at the time it was, it was fast, but it was even. And then when it turned into AFib, AFib is fast and it's, it, they call it irregularly re irregular. So your heart just goes, there's no pattern to it. And it's a whole different thing. So I always feel like if I had have just gone and got checked when it was just the racing, but I thought I knew the cause. I thought, oh, I took too many mm -hmm. lozenges okay. today, ease off, and it would go away after 20 minutes. I just relaxed. So I think in hindsight, the signs were there and I ignored them. Okay. The, the other thing I ignored was my high blood pressure. And I actually, my family doctor and me got into a, a a very heated argument. He was trying to get me to take blood pressure pills and I refused. And he got really pushy about it. And n looking back, he was right to do so. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I like I, I was at the time, I, you know, a big powerlifting guy and much bigger than my doctor. I literally stood up and told him to back off. And he did because <laughs> I was like <laughs> so mad at how pushy he was. Right. And, right. and, about a year after this, I was actually in his office crying and asking for his forgiveness for not following his wow. advice about that. Okay. So there's a life lesson people can like. I always say I'm I'm your terrible example that you should learn from. Let me be the mm. terrible example. <laughs> you know, I, I, I lived my life in such a way that almost guaranteed I was going to have AFib. I was overweight. I ignored my cardio training. I was powerlifting and lifting these big, massive weights that would drop my probably jack my blood pressure to the moon it was so it's only a matter of time and so i'm grateful it was afib it could have been a stroke it could have been a heart attack i could have burst a vessel instead i've got afib which is um highly treatable especially if it's caused by just poor health you can you can address the health and that will greatly improve your afib okay so so, so is afib itself is it life-threatening like other, I know you talked about like the hospital, the anxiety, but is it, um, is it life threatening? Like if that first episode happens to someone. So at that the moment? AFib patient community, um, technically yes, because being an AFib too long can, can trigger another arrhythmia. Okay. That is deadly. Okay. But it's really rare. So we always remind each other. Nobody dies of AFib. Okay. Okay. okay? But. The comorbidities that probably led you to AFib are okay. going to come along and kill you. Mm -hmm. AFib's like treated like a warning sign. Okay. Okay. So that's treated like a warning of course sign. They're genetic. Of course, they're genetic people. Yeah. And I've had ultra runners with AFib I've interviewed on my channel mm -hmm. sure. who are doing everything right. So there's always a luck of the draw. But right. 
Right. Treat AFib like the warning sign. Okay. So how did you treat AFib? Um, at first I didn't. At first I, I sat at my desk and I, uh, and when I wasn't working, I just played some video games cause I was afraid to exercise. Mm -hmm. I was definitely afraid to go back and power lift because every time I would go and power lift, I ended up back in the hospital that night and have to mm -hmm. uh, like get shocked or put on medication to oh, put geez. me back in normal rhythm. Right. So I've been, I've been uh, paddled four or five times with the paddles wow. and um, just to get me back into normal ways. And it's not like it looks in the movies. It's a very different thing. They give you an anesthetic. You're, you're quite comfortable and they do it while you're knocked out. And oh, uh, interesting. yeah, okay. but um, it's actually coincidentally, the shocking <laughs> of my heart has never worked. It's never worked for me. And I always end up having to get medication and just sitting there while this IV bag is dripping into me mm -hmm. and just praying, oh, please work. Please work. Because when I'm in AFib, it's very bad. Like my AFib uh, episodes, I won't call them attacks. We call them episodes. episodes okay. They're very intense. And that's also partly because for me, they're so rare, at least now. So they, as AFib progresses, you have it more often. But you sort of get more used to it to the point where we have like President Joe Biden. He's an AFib 100 percent of the time and has been for 25 years. So he's walking around an AFib. Right. And he's one example. But there is a lot of people who are in permanent AFib, which is the final progression point. Wow. And as, as long as the heart rates, you know, controlled and, and slowed down, so it's not 150 beats a minute, mm -hmm. they're walking around. It might take a couple years off their life, but it leaves you more vulnerable to stuff like um, congestive heart failure or, or leaky valve because your heart is, you know, not pumping things in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, you know, long term, you know, ima imagine your car, you know, you're letting the, sometimes you're letting the starter motor drive you down the driveway instead mm. of the real engine it's right. it's a bit like eventually a part's going to wear out it's going to so, wear okay yeah so you want to uh, you, you can't ignore it but at the same time you can't let it dominate your life okay okay so how did you not let it dominate your life what did you do well i was extremely uh, scared and anxious to train and exercise my health was declining uh, my weight was going up i was already 325 pounds and around 345 pounds um, I thought this sucks. I'm just going to go lift weights. And, um, I ended up in the hospital and this was just before the Canadian long weekend. And I got admitted to the hospital and I, and this was during wave two of COVID. Okay. Okay. And in Canada, we were on one of the, one of the most locked down places in the world, especially here in Ontario. So I was admitted to the ER very bad. I was really bad. The cardiologist said, you know, you have AFib, but it keeps going into ventricular fib, which is deadly. Mm. Your potassium and magnesium are also dangerously low. And they tried to shock me out of it and they couldn't. And they couldn't give me the drugs until my potassium and magnesium were come up. And, and though you can't just give someone instant magnesium or potassium, it takes a couple of hours to go through. So I was in ICU overnight um, for one very long, scary night. And around six in the morning, I, I came out of AFib. And I was like, I was. So anyway, I ended up spending uh, five days in the hospital because it was so bad they wanted me to monitor. And so that morning, I was so weak. Imagine you're, you're a power lifter with a gold medal on your wall. Mm-hmm. The next morning, I needed a nurse to help me get out of bed to a wheelchair so that I could get to the bathroom because I couldn't stand on my own. That's wow. how weak I was right. from that. And just imagine like a very humbling time. So during that time, this cardiologist is just this wonderful lady and she'd come visit me every single day and she didn't have to. And she said, Danny, the best thing you can do is when you go home is to walk an hour a day. Don't lift weights, just go walk an hour a day. That's the best thing you can do. So I was like, when can I get out of this room? Because <laughs> of COVID. Right. And and the minute that I passed my second COVID test is negative, they said, okay, now you can leave the room, but you can't leave the ward because you're wearing a heart monitor and we have to stay in range. Mm -hmm. 
So I started doing laps. And I would get about maybe 400 meters, let's say, 1,000 uh, feet. And I was worn out. And I was like, wow, my cardio is so bad. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it's not the AFib now. I've been out of AFib two, three days. My cardio just sucks. Right. And, and so when I went home, my rule was whenever I feel the ectopic beats, I was going to get up and do a 10 minute walk. So, and it took my mind off the scariness of the beats mm -hmm. and it seemed to even them out a bit. So when my heart was being really wonky, I would just go for a 10 minute walk. And then I was like, okay, just that 10 minute walk left me out of breath. That's how terrible my cardio was. I, I always say I want to go from my basement upstairs to my bedroom. I had to stop on the middle landing and catch my breath. That's how bad, but I was, you know, squatting 440 pounds and mm -hmm. bench pressing 345 for reps and deadlifting, you know, 545. And I couldn't walk up my freaking stairs to my bedroom without taking a break. So it was really bad. I had a long way to go. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started walking the block and it turns out the little block on my house is 0.4 miles. Mm -hmm. And then the big block is 0.8 miles. And then I started putting them together to get 1.2 miles. Okay. <laughs> and then I realized, well, I could do 0 0.8, 0 0.8 and 0 0.4. And now I have two mile walk. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, you know, and I started playing numbers games like that. And just without realizing that I was setting fitness goals for walking. And I was also, I'm also a big empirical guy. I like numbers, mm -hmm. right? So I noticed this one hill I would always go up. My heart rate would get to like 112, 115. And I was scared to get my heart rate over 110. To me, that's in the risk zone to set off an AFib attack, okay, or episode. Um, but within about a month, I was climbing that same hill. My heart rate wouldn't get over 95. Mm. So pretty like it was dramatic. That's right. a huge difference, right? So, so pretty quickly. I mean, one month from hospital bed to yeah. to that hill, and keeping your heart rate low and steady. That's that's amazing. That's that. I mean, I now there, there, the power there of walking. A, there was another thing that occurred during that time that's going to get some credit, okay. and that I I had gone finally got my sleep study, and got a prescription for CPAP, and I started uh, that. And I also fixed the sleep apnea. So those two things happened together. Mm. And and this, this is the thing about any sort of when you when you take that first step on a journey, the stars align and things come together. Mm -hmm. So I got my CPAP and I started sleeping really well and really deep. And I started feeling refreshed in the mornings. And that was like, great, I'm going to go for a walk. And then I started to walk before bed because it would help me sleep better. And these things just started to build on themselves. And after about, let's say, a year, I lost a, I lost back the 25 pounds. Mm -hmm. I wasn't dieting at all. I was still eating terribly. But I, I did lose back the extra 25 pounds. Right. And that's when I decided, fuck it, I'm really going for it. Right. And I, then, then I escalated up to running, went back. And after, after a while, I could start powerlifting again without setting off my AFib. Nice. So yeah. I, I I give so much credit to walking because okay. I say, you know, wa walking's accessible. You can do it. There's a low barrier to entry. The other thing about walking, especially if you're trying to lose weight, you you go get on, on your bicycle and do your intervals. You're freaking hungry after. You go for a run. Go do a three-mile run. You are hungry after. If you're a big guy like me, who's trying to lose weight, mm -hmm. those things will jack your appetite. A powerlifting session, two and a half hours, I'm starving after one of those. Right. But I could go for a walk and not jack my appetite to the moon. Yes. And that was a that was a big deal when I was trying to lose weight. And um, because I'm an empirical guy, the other thing I noticed was if I just took a break at lunch and walked a mile, Nothing changed if I did same diet, same calories, same running program, same weightlifting program, but I just did that extra mile at lunch, which was easy, very slow pace. It was relaxed, not sweating, not really raising my heart rate over, let's say, 80, right? Um, my weight loss that week would double, but the amount of effort I put in was only an extra 10%. Mm. 
So, I, like, I, that's when I started thinking that just walking is like this secret sauce that we've all we've all been looking down our nose at. Like, it's not serious exercise, but in fact, it's probably one of the best exercises there is. I agree wholeheartedly. I've I've been doing so much about walking, and my subtitle of my book: easiest way to get in shape and stay in shape. And I yeah. believe that in, in talking to you and hearing your story, it just, it just solidifies that. It really is. And it's accessible. And um, I used to wear this light up vest I got on Amazon when I started walking, because this is how when you like I said, the jack in a box or a heart. Mm. Right. So I had this image that I'm I'm in Canada. The winters are cold. I'm walking around at night. It gets dark very early. If, if my AFib goes off and I pass out, which actually really doesn't happen, but you think it will, that's your anxiety. Yeah. At least if I'm wearing the light up bed, <laughs> someone's going to see me laying in the snow and call 911. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. So I bought this light up vest and um, I haven't felt the need to wear the vest in a long time, but uh, I needed that little extra just to take the like a security blanket. I needed my little security blanket. Sure, sure. And so, so if if you need a security blanket, like my security blanket was so bright you could see it a mile away. Mm. So don't be embarrassed to have your security blanket because right. probably in three months you won't need it. Right, right. You probably just won't need it. So if it's poles, if you're walking with poles, or your walker, tents are it's only a temporary situation. Mm. Mm. So. Um, if it gets you out there and turns your life around and someone thinks it's funny looking, who cares? Really, right. who cares? Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's your life. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, what a, that, that is a, a great uh, that's a great story. So happy that you're doing well. You look wonderful. Um, Thank you. How, how long how long have you how long ago was this uh, your first AFib incident? Oh, you're going to make me break out the spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I would say, uh, what's wave one of COVID? The January just before wave one is when I discovered I had AFib. Okay, so uh, January, about, uh, about 2020. Yeah, so at, when I found out I had AFib, it, it, COVID was just something weird happening in China and Italy. Yes, so, so it's in January 20. Hadn't come to our shores yet, yes, right? Okay. So that's when I had now, I, I had AFib, a bad episode, about every two or three weeks um, and where I'd have to go in the hospital for about four or five months. And then when I started walking in the CPAP, um, I went um, a year and two months without an episode. Wow. Now, in the last thousand, almost 1,100 days, I've only had that one episode, and that was the one. Um, when I was in Switzerland this summer, I celebrated my another year without AFib. I did it as a live stream from from this lake in Switzerland. Beautiful. You know, my last day in Switzerland was also my, you know, another year with zero <laughs> AFib. Uh, I am going for ablation surgery because I want to get off the meds. So unfortunately, this is where all the cardio has worked a bit against me. I'm on a beta blocker, which slows your heart rate, okay. which helps keep the AFib away. But my resting heart rate is about 36. Okay. It's really low. low yes. And every time they give me the monitor to wear a few days, my resting heart rate seems to get just a little slower. Okay. So we want to get me off the meds. So that's why I'm getting the ablation surgery. They say I'm a great candidate because of the weight loss, because I got my blood pressure under control. I'm not, I went from like a 40% chance of success to 85%. Oh, well, wow. can you, uh, uh, ablation surgery, can you explain that briefly? Sure. So uh, ablation is um, because what happens in your heart, um, I don't know if this is a visual or audio podcast yet, but I'm going to we'll, use We'll, we'll do visual. Use your hands. Yeah. We're, we're but what happens in your, your heart is you have, you have the signals are supposed to travel from one spot in your heart, like your pacemaker, and like travel these known pathways. But there are other places in your heart that will can create signals. And then they'll send off those signals, and then the wrong parts of your heart respond to the wrong signal, and then you have AFib or oh, okay. dysrhythmia. Okay, so what they do is in an ablation, it's usually your, your big pulmonary arteries that are sending out those signals. So they'll burn a ring around it, and that'll form like a scar, and the scar won't conduct electricity over it. 
So they're sort of corralling in those bad signals so the rest oh, of your heart okay. doesn't receive the signal, like a mm -hmm. firewall. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So so the, the odds of success correlate very highly with weight loss and with well-controlled blood pressure, so the lifestyle things, right? So the same things that leave you vulnerable to AFib also make it less likely the surgery will work. Mm -hmm. It's a day surgery. You go in, you're done in a couple hours, you leave the same day. It's a very, like I said, lots of money thrown at AFib research. Mm. It's it's a very common procedure. So I'll probably have that in the next one to three months. I'm obviously going to cover the experience on my channel. Okay. And, um, you know, if anyone's interested, I mean, come along. I'm very honest on my channel. I just uh, tell it okay. like it is. So. All right. So, one, you're a great example of someone who's taken a difficult life situation and has turned it around. So that I commend you for that. Where can uh, where can my audience follow you and follow this uh, surgery? Where, where, what's the best place to, to uh, get? Yeah, I have, I've, I'm, I've kind of spread myself a bit thin, I guess. But I mean, the best place is to go to BigNorthernBear.com okay. and sign up for my email alerts. And then you're going to find me no matter what platform <laughs> I post stuff. I have a Facebook group called because everyone's afraid to exercise with AFib. So I have a Facebook group called Training and Exercising with AFib. Beautiful. And there's actually athletes of all levels, including European champion powerlifters, endurance cyclists, stunt cyclists of all levels in there. I have living your life with AFib, which is more about, you know, coping with the anxiety and getting support for that. So those are two support groups for people with AFib. And of, number one is my YouTube channel. I really enjoy being on YouTube. I like interacting with the audience on YouTube. I have live streams. And I talk about stuff like my struggle, some struggle to get off, not just my struggles with AFib, but my struggles with diet and, and the fact that I'm dependent on a sleeping pill and can't seem to get off it. Like I just, and I just really want to get real with my audience because they have their own struggles. And so I find the live streams great because I can actually interact and take questions in real time. So you can check out the AFib show live on YouTube and, uh, Right. That's a, that's a place right. to find me. Depends how how you like it. I do have a podcast called Ticker Talks, and I'll probably okay. I I basically do a purpose, right? So I've made a video, and I'm like, oh, you know, this make a nice listening experience. So I'll put it into the podcast, and that's in all the usual places. But, right. Wow. Well, so yeah. you're you're all over, but you're reaching <clears throat> you're reaching people who who need this information. I mean, you talked about anxiety. I'm sure that has to be a huge factor in. Your quality of life when you have AFib, and I guess having you as an example of going through it and doing well with it has to be a, a, a motivating force for your audience. The, the hardest thing for the new AFibber is the anxiety. Mm. Um, there are some people that's like, oh, it turned out it was just AFib and I'm fine. Those are the minority. Most okay. people, most people, they have AFib. It was quite dramatic. They never know when it's going to go off again, and they feel like they're living in landmine. The other thing that people with AFib struggle with uh, is that we always feel like people without AFib cannot understand why we feel that way, right? Like there's a – there's underst I understand you're anxious. I understand it must be scary living with a jack-in-box in the heart, Right. But they, they can't profoundly understand it because they haven't had that experience. Right. And one of the best ways to relieve that anxiety is actually to talk to someone else with AFib because now that barrier goes away. It's like I always compare it to, you know that movie Avatar? Yes. So there's a beautiful thing in there that the Navi do when a member of the tribe really stands out and does something great. And they say, I see you. And that means I've seen, I'm in this moment, I've seen into your soul and I see your potential. Mm. It's not that they see them. <laughs> it's <laughs> that they truly see them. And they, in that moment, they relate to them like at a truly deep level. Right. And so when I talk to another AFibber and they talk to me, I feel like I see them and they see me. And that can really improve your anxiety. Just realizing I'm not alone. It's normal to be scared other people are feeling scared and so that's why it's a big point of me like when i was uh we went to europe it was a once in a lifetime trip this summer i went to the top of the swiss alps and i recorded from there because i want to see people 
I'm up here. The air is so thin. My Apple Watch can't even pick up my blood oxygen. And yet I and there's no ambulance for 10 hours and there's no helicopter that can get here to get me. Right. Yet here I am living my life. Right. And I want I want people to see that so that they at least have the courage to go try to walk around the block and mm. just build on that. So I really want people to live their life because that is the absolute best thing. Um, can I tell one more two minute story? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Please. The story of how I started my mm. channel was I was during that, that time where I started to transition from walking to running and I got my diet in order and the weight started coming off. I was, I've been in these Facebook groups hosted by other people and I'm not denigrating the groups at all. They're wonderful groups, but I prefer to have my own because I don't like people giving me rules about what I can say and what I can't. <laughs> right. So I just started my own groups. Um, but th there's everyone I'm afraid to exercise. Like it would come up. So I started exercising my heart and so I stopped. There's a lot of panic. So I was like, Oh, this is, and I'm doing so well. So I'm on my treadmill and I'm thinking about this. So I'm like, oh, fuck it. So I just turned on my phone. And while I was running, I just did like a four minute monologue. And I explained how, you know, my journey, like with the walking and everything. And because I'm saying you don't know where it's going to take you. And in fact, at the end of on this run, it will be my 800th mile for the year. And my first five mile run, mm. right on my treadmill, and it's a treadmill I bought during the pandemic, and 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 then at the end of the video, I just turned the phone around so they could see, and the sound quality was terrible, and all you could hear, you could barely hear my voice over the treadmill. It was just terrible, okay. And I threw that into the Facebook groups, and I say I made this video for all you people afraid to exercise with AFib. Mm. It went viral on Facebook among the wow. AFib groups. It went viral. I got like on Facebook, I got thousands of comments. I needed this. This is exactly what I need. So I call that the treadmill video. But okay. all these people are, this is what I need. This was a kick in the ass. And I changed, I feel like I changed 200 lives that day. Beautiful. And at that point, it's like, oh, this, I have to do another. So I did another video and I threw it in the groups. And the group said, you're not allowed to self promote. And they deleted my videos. Oh, wow. We don't let you self promote. That's okay. I'm starting my own group because this is a message people need. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, that's uh, turning uh, turning uh, lemons into lemonade, right? Well, you don't know. And, like, and you, you take that first step out your door. Yeah. You have no clue where that journey is going to take you. Mm -hmm. You d you don't know, right? Like, uh, but you you'll never know unless you start. Exactly. So people, please start. If you have congestive heart failure, if you have a heart condition, all these things can be treated by walking almost at the same efficiency or better than medication, mm. right? Without the side effects. Plus, medication might reduce your quality of life. I mean, mm. it's a trade-off. Meds are a trade-off. But walking will only improve your quality of life. So... Uh, Frank, what you're doing with your walking books, I mean, that's the message. So many people look down on walking. I used to look down on walking. That's not real exercise. It's the wrong. It is. It is. Yes. Once you have to do it and see the benefit. And then you're yeah. like, aha, uh -huh. it's like someone opened this world of. I was seeing through ignorance goggles before. Right. Like it, it really can improve your improve your health. Absolutely, like Absolutely. large amounts, yes. large amounts. Well, like that's got a back injury got me into walking, not life threatening, but quality of life threatening, and that's why, much like you, did your video to promote and encourage people. It's the same thing that I'm doing here. So yeah, uh, get get out there and walk. It's a great I mean, message. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and you you keep carrying it forward, okay. All right, my friend. Yeah. Well, th thank you so much. Anything you want to uh, finish up on, end up on, talk? Yeah, about I just want I just want to tell your audience that uh, thank you, thank you for hearing my story. And uh, you know, if if you come by and listen to a video, leave a comment. I always try to reply, and I like to hear your stories too, even if it's not a heart condition. Right. I like to. I really like to hear 
your success stories and um you know they motivate me and i could use a little motivation right now so don't be afraid to come and and uh, and comment on one of my videos i'd love to hear from you and if right. you do have a heart rhythm disorder my groups are there for you we welcome you in. don't be shy about joining and introducing yourself so very nice well danny thank you so much thank you for spending time with me my audience and it's danny at big northern bear yeah, bignorthernbear.com. Dot com, okay. And you, you can just email me at bignorthernbear at gmail.com if you want. Wonderful. So, okay. Thank you, Danny, so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now, you just heard Danny talk about walking as a secret sauce that helps the body in so many ways. Besides the benefits to help keep Danny's AFib under control, you just heard him say that just an easy walk every day at lunchtime doubled his weight loss for the week. Click the link in the show notes to find out more about my Walking for Health and Fitness Complete Walking program. Now, walking is the easiest way to get in shape and stay in shape. And with my program, you'll work on your motivation and your why to get you out the door and walk every day. Danny's why was pretty straightforward. Walking helps him control his heart condition. My why was to get out of debilitating back pain. We all have a why, and my program will help you zero in on yours. You'll learn to set fitness goals to keep you on track. You'll learn how to develop the habit of getting out the door each day. And most important, you'll learn how to hold yourself accountable. And in honor of Danny's being the first guest on my show, I'm going to leave a discount code in the description for $20 off my complete walking program. Just use the discount code DannyBear1 at checkout. Hey, this is Frank again for Walking for Health and Fitness. Check out the other videos that I have playing all around me here. Uh, again, I've got some great content to get you on your way to better health and fitness through walking. Yeah.